Is there, is there a book, because uh, there are a number of them out there, is there a book that you think accurately describes what happened? There are a number of books that it, purport it, yeah. to do that. It, it, no, you have to put them all together. You have to get Polson's book. You have to get uh, Andrew uh, Sorton. Andrew does probably the best uh, book. Uh, he doesn't have the congressional perspective. No, no. Well, the, we haven't yet written that. And, and, that, and probably one of these days uh, when you guys succeed in getting me thrown out of my seat, I may sit down and write that uh, book. No, I, there were just a few of us that were there, actually, and uh, are aware of, of, of really internally what happened. Uh, it, it, it's interesting. I, I, you can, you know, when when Paulson was leaving Treasury and he called me, we had a nice chat for, oh, I don't know, 45 minutes or an hour. Uh, it, it just went through some of those hours and some of those days and some of the things that we experienced. And uh, the other day, when a matter of fact, when I was waiting for the, the uh, health care bill, it was Sunday morning. I was at uh, my apartment in Washington. Telephone rang, and it was a good, friendly voice on the other side. I, I needed that friendly voice. It was Bill Clinton. And we sat down and chatted for about an hour and a half of where we were and traded stories as, as to what we've done and what we could have done. And, and having nothing to do with the health care bill, we actually discussed it very little. Just He was curious, how, how was I going to vote? Of course, I'd already decided. I hadn't publicly announced it, so I told him. But we went into revisiting uh, the need for fiscal responsibility and how we had fiscal responsibility in 93 and how successful it was and we let somebody steal it from us and and I and, and I said to the president that was interested I said you know if you think about because I got them the last eight votes on the 93 budget act I got those people I talked them into voting they did vote that way seven of those people didn't return to the Congress they cast a vote and lost their seats and it was very unfortunate. Would I do it again? Yes, I'd do it again. I just don't want to know that I'm killing them, that's all. But uh, I, I reminded him that if we hadn't allowed the ill-informed uh, politicians of the year 2000 to campaign on it's your money, you deserve it, not the government, and we're going to change the tax laws of the United States, with the Bush policy, people you support it, we wouldn't have had the Bush tax cut. If we hadn't had the Bush tax cut in, in 2001, today we would be burning the last note of debt of the United States government without changing any of the tax rates, without changing any of the budgetary policy of the United States, just keeping on the same course that Clinton had instituted in 93 with his Budget Act. Today this country would be free of debt. What would that mean? It would mean we wouldn't have to be spending $600 billion on interest every year. That money could go to solve the Social Security problem and solve the Medicare problem. Instead, we falsely, foolishly, and stupidly allowed people because, on the very reason, I'm not casting aspersions on, on, on one political party or another, we're, we're constantly allowing people to misinform us. If any point I want to make on the Health Care Act, there are no death panels. There never were any death panels. It is not only intellectually dishonest to, to express those things, it's criminally dishonest to do it because they misled people down the road, scared the hell out of people who closed their minds and just said, no, I'm against it. When in fact, when they discovered, particularly senior citizens, they're going to have better health coverage through prescription medicine, they're going to get a yearly exam for health care, and they're going to get rehabilitation support systems that they've never had before. Now, we cannot continue to allow uh, that misstatement of fact. In our system, maybe I'm, I, I'm going on, but in our system, under the First Amendment, we had a great check and balance. We had the free press. We counted on the free press to hold the constraints of misrepresentation disinformation. But the free press, to a large extent, even my friends, Andrew Sorkin, he's more interested in getting his book published and the movie made. They're casting the damn movie. That's what he's interested in now. And the reality is, if he's really a journalist, he's, he's a holder of the truth. He's a steward of the truth. We need people like that. We don't need booksellers. We don't need movie makers. If they want to be booksellers or movie makers, let them go into that profession. 
But in your profession, in the press, the only check and balance to keep our system moving and real democracy is if you practice your profession up to its great standards. And I, I you know, I, I just say that I, uh, right now we're seeing a deterioration of that happening in the system. And I, I think we're going to see a, and maybe that's out of Watergate, and the final Watergate era may be over. I hope it is. I want to back up to your uh, yep. conversation there about fiscal responsibility and your conversation with Clinton. In December, you were among those people to vote for increasing the national public debt limit yep. from 12.1 trillion to 12.39. Was that a difficult decision? No, <laughs> it's a, look, you know, I, I make those decisions. I mean, politically, I knew it would be a punishing decision. I mean, I've got to explain to people why I voted to increase the debt of the United States. Not difficult if they're listening. We've spent the money, we've allocated the money, we've cut the revenues of the United States, and we've spent more money for services in the United States. To the best of my knowledge, that gives you a deficit. And now you've got an obligation to pay. And the way you do that in the United States is rather than increasing the revenues or decreasing the expenditures, we go to China, we get on our knees, and we beg them to buy some of our bonds so we can spend some of their money. And at some point in time, Americans are going to realize that's not good fiscal policy. We had that from 1993 until 2000. But unfortunately, the American people didn't understand what that lesson was all about. If President Obama were to call you to the Oval Office and say, I'd like your recommendations on what can be cut, are there, are there areas of national spending that you think are right for the cutting? Are we talking about space exploration oh. or oh. foreign aid? Oh, all, all of those things. Quite frankly, yes. Matter of fact, I have it contained in my bill. One of the things we have uh, in the uh, Investors Protection Act is new rights, powers, and authority for the Security Exchange Commission. And I call for an in-depth, comprehensive study, not only of the SEC, but all its related organizations. Uh, we haven't had it for years and years and years. And, and the only thing that we have had is their own internal studies, which are okay, but they're all gauged from the perpetuation of the leadership that's there in the defense of the agency itself. I think the Congress has to do this. The American people have to see this study. I, I, I model it in such a way that if it becomes law, and I think it will become law, it, it should be the model to do it to all other agencies in government. Get, let's get into the agriculture department. Let's get into the hard issues of subsidies, whether they're good, bad, or should they be modified? Have they been uh, not attended to lately? You can go all the way through the United States government and find that. I mean, we're building aircraft and weapons that will never be used in the military, and the military will tell you that they'll never be used because the nature of war has changed. But the industrial military complex has it. They like to make their super widget weapon. And they make a lot of money on it. And as long as people are foolish enough, because if you try and cut that widget weapon, your opponent in an election says, he's against national defense. He's putting you at risk. Because what do they, what do they know about the systems we're buying? And that's our problem. Now, you know, it's a very complicated system. And, and part of it is, ultimately, comes down to, to a large degree, uh, uh, the electorate has to rely on, on the good faith and the good smarts of their president, their vice president, and their congress. And unfortunately, uh, that has deteriorated to such an extent. Uh, it, it, well, I'll tell you to what extent. When I travel and people ask me what I do for a living, when I first got elected, I was a lawyer. And I used to tell people, oh, I'm a member of Congress, and I was proud of it. When I'm an airplane and some nice little lady leans over, a gentleman and says, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a lawyer. I don't want to tell him. Because there's no respect out there for the institutions. We have to rebuild that respect. 